سلام يا حوات يا حات انقع عبد الحان مزاخم ازي زعبا وي سيمينار كم تلمود بمحبر متحققاز ايرتراوين تشيكاغون كبابيان استودبو خينو ا ورحي حدا غزي كني زكو ابز كوفيد برتيلوز نبرك ا ورحي خلت غزي نيرو نايلو معلتي استمرو مسن امرو مسرو امراوي تعنا وي تشينكاز تحزو خينو ات استمرو ادلاينت سنو امرو تعنا تشينكات منصار ملكتاتون ميلاتون مكنخان معباي زحجزيو ام إذا سمرو زخاني بخيلا سنامرو أب شيكاغون كبابيان كبابي سلاس عمل أب تومي هذا سرحة أمير تموكرو زلوا دكتور لوسي إبراهيم كوهابي حسابات أخت كافلنا يمالتيو مبزحة جزي سبوز زخاني رديت يبلنا أب سنامرو زملكة مالتيو تتعيس سنامرو مهلاقين حمرت ناي كلنا جر مخانو كل جزي نرسع مالتيو امور داتا نایحتون ریتون گذاشته لون نای مالاتی انتهای که گبرگن ندکتر لوسی بینگلیش در تزارب ات تازه بول کم بینگلیش کرده من که بتنی مالات. So welcome, good morning, thank you for taking your time. This seminar is the second generation of the monthly seminar given by the European. Assistance Organization in Chicago. Uh, today, we are going to learn more about the important uh, mental health topic of depression, how to identify it, and how to help those who might have struggling with it. Uh, good mental health may be a topic we do not discuss often in our community. It's a taboo, a taboo but it's very uh, important. Um, it's a vital part of our life. Uh, I just am going to mention one saying of uh, C.S. Lewis. What he said is, um, it's easier to say my tooth is hurting than to say my heart is broken. But it's kind of hidden. We don't see it. You know, so, so our guest speaker is Dr. Lucy Ibrahim, uh, uh, practicing psychiatrist from the Chicago uh, land area with over 30 years of experience. Uh, she's going to share her insight and answers any question you may have on this topic. Uh, Dr. Lucy is, uh, as I said, a psychiatrist specialist, um, over 37 years of experience in the medical field. She graduated from uh, Loyola University School of Medicine in the 80s. Um, so Dr. Lucy, a bit introduction of yourself and share your knowledge, experience, experts. Uh, it will be uh, it's your your it's yours now. I'm really excited to hear uh, this presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for asking me. Uh, you know to to speak to the community. Um, it is very important. Uh, you know this um, what we call depression. It is an illness, um, and. It deserves serious attention and hopefully um, we'll find out why. Um, I'd like to start by saying that just, just as we have other medical illness uh, that we treat with medication, um, like high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, heart disease, cancer, and so on and so on. Uh, just as we have the such medical illness that requires medical, scientific medical attention and is treated by medication, the same goes for this illness called depression. And so my, my focus is going to be on this illness that we call depression, as opposed to as opposed to the common, natural, human reaction to loss, um, which we call grieving. That, that's a reaction, a human, emotional, psychological reaction to loss. 
So that's something else. We, I, I would like to separate these two because when it comes to grieving a loss, this is natural, normal, and it does not require medical treatment per se. On the other hand, depression, the illness. Depression is a biological or biochemical illness like diabetes. It is actually very genetic. So it runs in families. It can be inherited. The prevalence is about 10% per year. However, it may be, it's probably more than 10%. It's probably more than 10%. It is one illness. However, there are many variations, many subtypes. So it's quite a spectrum. Depression is important because it can, it can truly destroy one's life. And that includes literally destroy one's life as in suicide. This, this illness drives people to suicide. And at the same time, it is very treatable, highly treatable. One of the most treatable conditions that we have in the scientific, in our scientific field. Now, treatment, treatment is primarily with medication. Uh, talk therapy, counseling of various sorts, these are all important. Prayer, obviously, needless to say, prayer, we are Christians and everything begins with prayer and hope. Uh, but this illness is primarily treated with medication, although other forms of treatment, psychological treatment, counselors, uh, psychotherapy, this is helpful as well. It helps us learn about depression. It helps us cope with depression. It helps us, uh, it teaches us skills uh, to, to manage depression, but the actual treatment is primarily medication just like heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, etc. Now, there are many, many symptoms um, that, that are caused by depression. In fact, depression, uh, affects affects a person on so many levels so many many levels and i'd like to mention you know some of these symptoms uh, of course the chemical problem is in the central nervous system you know diabetes the problem is the pancreas and blood sugar. Depression, it is the central nervous system and various chemistry, ba a balance or imbalance of chemistry in the central nervous system, okay? I'll come back to the symptoms in a moment, but I also wanted to mention that we have, we have excellent treatment, however, 
excellent treatment is still not a cure. We do not yet have a cure for this disease, but we do have excellent treatment options. Now, what are some of these symptoms? Again, remember the source of the problem is the central nervous system, the brain. Okay. Well, we have emotional symptoms such as people feeling sad, people feeling nervous, worried, or even having panic attacks, people feeling like they just don't care about anything or anybody, apathy, um, and lack of joy, the inability to feel joy, even in things that would normally bring a person joy. So these are emotional symptoms. There are psychological symptoms. For instance, self-esteem goes down, self-confidence goes down, feeling insecure, our thoughts even become distorted. Um, you know, we can, we can uh, misinterpret what someone says or what someone meant. You know, we become very sensitive to everything. So those are, those are examples of psychological symptoms. Cognitive symptoms, cognitive symptoms, for example, poor concentration and forgetfulness. These can also be uh, symptoms of depression. Mental, mental symptoms, for example, you know, people, you know, not being alert, not being with it. People will say that, um, you know, they are a little bit in a fog. Um, people lose interest. People lose motivation to do things. Physiological symptoms. Uh, depression definitely affects sleep and appetite. Typically, uh, insomnia and a loss of appetite. Last but not least, functional symptoms. For example, having the energy to function, uh, being able to get through activity or have a certain level of activity uh, is lost. So this gives you an idea about the, um, you know, the extent of the symptoms. And this is why I say it really affects, this illness really affects us on many different levels. It even makes, if a person has any kind of pain, depression will worsen that pain. Depression will worsen the experience of that pain. Of course, it happens to be vice versa. Chronic pain can also cause depression. This is a two-way two street. But um, as you can see from the symptoms we talked about, that this is a disease that can really, um, really stop us from, prevent us from functioning normally. And it can literally drive us to suicide. And yet it's treatable. 
so and and you know there I thank you to Sally for mentioning that it's a taboo. I think it's it's a taboo in just about all cultures, you know, more more so in some cultures than others, but it's an important point to 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 talk about, to bring up because think about it. Um is it a taboo to have diabetes? It is a taboo. Is it a taboo to have high blood pressure? No. It's it's a medical illness, and we go to a doctor, we get it treated, and we're well. This is the same thing. There's no taboo. It's chemistry. It's not the person himself, the character. And it's not even his coping ability. It's not his life circumstances. It's internal. It's chemistry. And it's medical. And treatable. So it really doesn't make sense at all that it's a taboo. You know, in the dark ages, we used to think, it was a taboo because we did not understand it. Uh, we thought it was, you know, mental illness, something strange, something scary, something embarrassing. Uh, you know, it's a weak, a weak person. Wrong, 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 and wrong. It's not that at all. So our scientific understanding of depression and advances in treatment have really come a long way. Um, you know, we can, we can talk about other things, but I wonder, for example, well, I mentioned, you know, depression often runs along with obsessive compulsive anxiety or panic attacks. Um, depression often runs uh, along with substance abuse, alcohol abuse, and drug abuse. Um, we can, and we can talk more about, you know, what, what runs along with depression, what can make it worse, etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, maybe as questions come up um, but for now um, how about if I if I just um, pause and see if there if there are any questions so far anything I can clarify any questions I can answer hi this is Gideon can you touch up on uh, some of those? Uh, you mentioned that they're treatable. What form of, uh, uh, I guess, can you talk a little bit about that, how that works or what that means? Yes, the treatment you mean. Correct. Okay. So primarily, okay, because this illness is biochemical. This is why the primary treatment is medication or we also have electric shock therapy. We still use it. It is still an excellent treatment. Of course, now we know how to use it in a much safer and, and more humane way but we continue to use it under certain circumstances. It is very effective and safe. So we have electric shock treatments. We have medications, many, many medication choices now, um, antidepressants, but that's only one class of medications. We have another two classes that we use in the treatment of depression. Uh, you know, the, 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 the famous class is the antidepressants, but we use 
the class of mood stabilizers. We use uh, the class of, um, uh, we call them atypical antipsychotics, but not the whole class, not that whole class, only a couple of, only a couple of medications in that class. Um, we now have, in recent years, we now have uh, what they call TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Same idea as the electric shock treatments, but not quite, not yet quite as effective as the electric shock treatments. Of course, it's easier, it's safer, less side effects. Okay. Medication though is really, really important. Um, but again, let me add whether it's, you know, any kind of psychological treatment, psychotherapy, talk therapy, counseling, these are all very helpful, very helpful. In fact, the literature, the studies tell us that it's a combination of medical treatment and some kind of uh, psychological treatment. It's the combination that works best. However, uh, you know, I usually like to remind people that if this, if depression is an illness of chemistry, internal chemistry, all the talking in the world is not going to actually change that chemistry. It's helpful in, in other ways, but it's not going to change the chemistry. But if you use chemicals, medication, if you use electrical treatment, if you use magnetic treatment, that changes the chemistry. But before I continue with medications, for example, um, I'd like to also say that it is a very depression. The illness of depression is also very cyclical. Just like hormones run on cycles or in cycles, this illness runs in cycles. It comes and goes and comes and goes. Although, as I, as I implied before, although the illness is very, very high risk in complications and losses and even death, suicide, Although that's the case, I must tell you that even when it is untreated, it's going to take its course and could eventually go away by itself, of course, only to come back because it's cyclical. So, and, and you know, it can last an average of two and a half years. That's a long time in a person's life. Um, it's cyclical and that's important. Why? Because even if it's properly treated, remember it can be very well treated, but it's not a cure. And it's cyclical, which means recurrence is always possible. In fact, we should expect recurrence rather than, you know, rather than 
hope that it, you know, never ever comes back. Okay. Um, but highly treatable, highly treatable every time it comes back. Now, the, the uh, okay. There's also other, other people also, they want to ask questions. I think Simon raised his uh, hands. Um, and then Burhan after that. Uh, I think Helen also posted. Um, Simon and Simon, has, you can, you, you can, huh? Simon has texted the question in the chat box. Oh, he posted. Okay, I see. Okay. So it says, how do you diagnose depression? How accurate is it? What type of tests are there and how reliable are they? There's multiple questions at the same time. That's okay, but uh, forgive me. Can you repeat the question, but just speak louder because I'm hard of hearing? Oh, sure. Okay. I'm sorry about that. All right. Uh, it says, how do you diagnose depression? How great is it? What type of tests are there and how reliable are they? Okay, so uh, what tests are there? How do you diagnose it? How reliable are the tests? Yes. Did I miss anything? Uh, yeah, no. Okay. Uh, no. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you basically have to see a doctor like myself. Although other doctors, primary care physicians should be able to tell and they can either start people on some medication or they can refer you to a specialist like myself, a psychiatrist. Even psychologists and, and therapists, you know, they are supposed to um, recognize depression in their patient and they are supposed to refer them to a doctor like myself. It doesn't always happen, but now how does a specialist diagnose depression? Well, yes, there are tests, but the tests are actually only helpful, they are not diagnostic. We do not have tests uh, that are actually diagnostic and therefore reliable. There are tests, uh, neuropsychological testing, uh, multi, uh, uh, no, the MMPI, uh, various psychological testing, they give us information, but they are not diagnostic of this disease. The diagnosis is made clinically by a doctor like myself. And, you know, it involves, it involves quite a bit. It's not just the symptoms that I mentioned before. It involves family history, past history, uh, you know, how long it has lasted, the impact on one's life. Um, family history is very important. So it, it, it um, for me to reach a diagnosis, I have to gather a, a lot of data, which I then put together and then draw my medical conclusion. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not at all. But I will say this, we always, we are taught in training, we always err on the side of treatment. What does that mean? If I'm not sure that there's clinical depression or not, 
it's better to try a medication as opposed to do nothing and wait. Because we lose far more if we do nothing and wait. We lose almost nothing. We don't lose anything if we try a medication. So that's actually the rule of thumb in treatment. Sometimes it's mild, sometimes it's very subtle, sometimes it's just not clear in a particular person. There's so many factors, you know. Uh, sometimes people have a hard time even describing how they're feeling. So there are many factors involved, difficulties involved. Um, You know, but if, if it has affected someone's life, you know, that, that's a big, that's a big red flag. If it's enough, whatever the symptoms, if it's enough that it affects your life or is a problem in, in your life, in functioning, that that's a big red flag. Um, I hope I answered the question. Um, Simon, I, th I think the other question was the how, I think you answered that because of the, you collected the data and then at the end you draw your conclusion. Um, there's also a question, Helen asked it. She, um, maybe Simon, if you have any question, you can do, uh, you, can, uh, you can ask a follow up question. Uh, feel free to do that. Helen said, can I ask a short question then? Thank you, by the way, uh, Dr. Lucy, appreciate it. So from your experience, um, uh, if you have enough data, is there a, a misdiagnosis? How often does it happen? How often are people diagnosed depression while it wasn't or they were not diagnosed depression while it was? Is this very rare or it happens a lot? Um, I can't say, I cannot say it's rare. I cannot say it happens a lot. I, I cannot give you any numbers or statistics. I can tell you it definitely happens. Um, for example, um, you know, if, if someone has had a major loss in life and they are grieving, and early on in the grief process, you know, it can look like depression, but it may not be depression. It may be just the process of human grief, but we can distinguish between the two. There's a way to distinguish between the two. So it's important to do that. Because when it comes to the grief process, you know, we, that, that's not a disease or an illness. Okay, thank you. I get it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, by the way, Simon, there are also other, uh, you know, depression can be missed or it can be misdiagnosed as other things. I just gave you one example. Okay. Got it. Mm -hmm. There is another question from, from Helen. Uh, her question says like that, if you are concerned about someone's having sign of uh, depression, how do you help them overcome the stigma associated with seeking help? Any um, anonymous resources that can be offered? You know, excellent question, of course. Um, you know, the very person who is worried uh, uh, about someone with depression, you know, again, you have to have 
you have to be knowledgeable yourself, familiar, and you have to approach the depressed person uh, in, in the appropriate way. Um, so that's a delicate, that's a delicate matter. You know, you need to be sensitive, you need to be knowledgeable, uh, you need to be um, empathic, you need, you need to give them hope, um, you know, be supportive, all, all those good things, okay? Um, you know, as opposed to come on, pull it together and, you know, get going already. That, that, that's not fair. That's not fair. It's like, it's like taking someone with, you know, both arms amputated and then throwing them in the Atlantic and saying, now swim, come on, you can do it, swim. No, it can't be done. Anyway, um, there are many, many resources now because the awareness of this illness are so much more aware. Uh, many resources, you know, hotlines, uh, whether it's you call an emergency room in a hospital or the police or the fire department 911 or you look online, uh, you know, there are many, many, um, many resources uh, available and our awareness is much better than, than it used to be. Um, it is so very important to explain to the person that there is no shame, no taboo, no embarrassment, because it is diabetes. It's just a different organ and different chemistry. It is diabetes. Um, you know, there is the, um, what is it? The National NAMI, National Alliance of the Mentally Ill. I don't like that, that name, that term, mentally ill. Uh, but anyway, there is that organization, just like there, there is uh, Parkinson's organization, dementia organization, you know, a lot of organizations that focus on one illness. So National Alliance of Mental Illness. Um, but as I said, it's easier than that. Any hospital, any emergency room, uh, you know, or you just uh, uh, look up, look up. Oh, how about the Illinois... Uh, or other than Illinois, but Illinois uh, Psychiatric Society. You know, they have a list. They keep a list of all of us professionals. You can call up your own insurance company and find out where they would refer you or which doctor they cover. There are really many, many resources. It's also, you know, we know it's much easier for people to go to a psychologist, a therapist of some sort, a counselor. It's easier for people to do that than to see a doctor like myself. And that's okay. That could be the first step. First step is better than no step. Unfortunately, though, there are too many times when the counseling just goes on and on and on and on. The patient is not referred to a doctor like myself, and the patient does not get better. If anything, they get worse. Because talk therapy, 
yes, it's helpful in, in a certain way, but it cannot change chemistry. Oh, by the way, medications. We are actually relatively lucky because by far, well, let me talk about antidepressants, that class, the antidepressant class of medications. We are relatively lucky in that they are relatively safe. They are not harmful to any organs. There is no permanent effect or change. Usually treatment with the right medicine for that individual means no side effects. We are relatively lucky. Although at the same time, I have to admit, you need to be seeing a competent psychiatrist because sometimes these antidepressants will make someone's mental condition worse. And if, if the doctor is not knowledgeable, does not recognize this, does not know what to do, we can end up with disaster. It's an adverse reaction. Antidepressants given under certain circumstances, antidepressants can actually worsen the condition, which is why we have two other classes to choose from. We have the atypical so-called antipsychotics, the atypicals, and we have mood stabilizers. Oh, medications are not habit forming. I mean, it's just not a big deal. So we're relatively lucky. Um, and then there's, an, there's also a question. I, there are many questions. Um, you know, people are just excited about your topic. Thank you so much. No problem. These insightful answers and presentation. Uh, Burhana asked, uh, he said, um, first of all, he, he thank you. Thank you for your time. And then he said, if depression, so depression can be caused by war or other traumas. And also depression can be caused, you know, just be because of the um, imbalance like that. Is there any difference between the two, he said? Uh, yes. Um, the biggest, the biggest factor is, you know, all of us human beings, because we are reasoning, we are reasoning people. You know, we look for reasons in our life that cause this illness. But the truth, the scientific truth is whatever, you know, what happens externally in our life typically does not cause this illness. This illness is like diabetes. It, is, it comes from within, it's genetic. Now, there are other uh, examples though. For example, there are certain illnesses that will bring on depression. Uh, pancreatic cancer. There are certain medical treatments like chemotherapy or steroids. So we have, we have those examples as well. But the biggest, most important example for us is that it is not external life factors that cause depression. 
depression comes from within. It is biochemistry, it is genetic, and it just, it just occurs, it manifests. So okay. is that helpful? Yeah, I, uh, I hope uh, she, uh, she answered your question, Brian. If you have a follow-up, feel free to add it. I just, uh, for, because our time is running, I may go to the next question, if it's fine with you. Do you, did she answer your question, Brian? I hope so. Yes. Okay, great. So the next question is, Mike, he said, um, uh, some people deny that they have signs and then symptoms of uh, depression. How can you convince them to seek medical or psychological advice? You know, unfortunately, you have to just try and convince them by examples. You know, you can examples like, you know, you're very withdrawn. You don't sit with us. You don't talk much. You don't want to do anything. Okay, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you have to you have to convince them. You know, you can't you can't just say, "I'm telling you, you're depressed," and you're denying it because they they may not they may not recognize it at all. They may not recognize it. So it's important to use examples, you know, tell them what you are seeing. Because usually depression will make a person not like their normal self. It affects, it affects us. So we are no longer like our normal self yeah and in our culture it's very difficult you know just, uh, uh, as, as basically as, as i mentioned that one before um when you talk about uh, depression or mental health usually they associate with something and then also if you take a medicine they think it has side effect you know will get you know you it will come worse and worse um, so basically it may not be your normal life. Um, that was their main concern. So it could be very difficult to convince them. Um, you know, something else I would try, for example, um, is I would say, you know, say I have a friend or a family member. I would say, look, let's just go and find out. No one no one can force you to take medication or to see this doctor or anything else. But instead of doing nothing, it's, which is unwise, let's just go and learn and find out. You can even learn, you know, online through the internet. You can read, read up on depression. And, and see, you know, see how, you know, your symptoms match. Okay, but doing nothing is not really not good. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I hope uh, Michaela, your your question answered. And then uh, just to time is running, and there's another question. There are many questions, so. We're bombarding with question. Is that okay with you? Yes, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, your Gallum asked, um, is depression related to ADHD? No. However, sometimes one is misdiagnosed with the other, both directions. Uh, and uh, it's, not, it's not unusual to see both of them run in the same individual. You know, some form of depression and ADD. 
remember, depression is one disease, but there are, it's a very, very wide spectrum, different subtypes. Okay, uh, great. Um, the other question is, Sanait, so uh, Sanai said, many people are afraid of the negative side effects of the uh, psychiatric medication. Can you explain the side effect of them? Uh, you, I think you explained some of them, but you can add some details to that. Okay. There's honestly, first of all, um, nothing serious. Nothing. Not side effects. Okay. Not, I'm, Remember, I mentioned adverse effects. That's serious. That's important. And, you know, the doctor better be knowledgeable and recognize it and so on and so on. But side effects, physical, they tend to be physical, nothing serious. Um, you know, I don't someone feels tired, it could be tiredness, it could be headache, it could be a stomach ache, it could be nausea, it could be diarrhea, just nothing serious. Uh, although, again, if the doctor is not very competent, you know, if, if a doctor gives a patient um, too many, too many, a mixture of too many medications. You know, there's, for example, something called the serotonin syndrome. That's serious. So basically, if, if, you know, you need, you need a competent psychiatrist, you need to be comfortable with, with, you know, with that doctor, you ask questions. The doctor should explain a lot. They owe you that. Okay, it's it's not it's not about here. Take this medicine and come back in two weeks or four weeks. It, it should not be like that. There should be a two way conversation. The doctor should explain, go over everything. Uh, but. In general, side effects are minimal and they're not even serious. It's not, the, the medications are not habit forming, nothing. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so it's almost to six now. Um, there are some questions, if you mind, can you uh, maybe stay for some, minute, some more minutes? Yes. But yes. also, I want to, we want to respect your time, so we don't want to... It, okay, so this is a question. So can I read the next question? Sure. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So Hanok, uh, he said, um, boxed warning of antidepressant depressant, depressant are uh, increasing risk of suicide thinking. Um, and natural product is, is saying, John, John, okay, John is what which may be helpful for treating depression uh, versus standard or traditional treatment. Okay, I'm sorry, Jasali. So the question is about um, uh, more natural treatments for depression? I think what he was saying is maybe a natural product uh, by St. John's um, work. St. John's work, yeah. St. John's work, um, it could be uh, helpful for treating a uh, depression versus the uh, standard treatment or the traditional traditional treatment, you saying? Yeah. What what's what's your what's your thought on that? Uh, my thoughts are yes. There there are these natural treatments. Uh, one is Saint John's Wort. Actually, there there are others also. I think one of them was Sam. Was it called Sam E? I anyway. But to be honest with you, I am not very familiar or knowledgeable about these treatments. You know, what I know is the medical treatment, uh, the conventional treatment. What I can say is, although some of these natural substances, although they can be helpful, 
one has to be very careful because I have seen some of my patients, you know, have a, have a bad reaction even with these natural substances. So it's not like, oh, natural substances, therefore it cannot hurt me. Uh, no, you could, you could run into a problem even if you're, if you're using these natural substances on your own. So ultimately, you know, maybe, you know, you can see a doctor like myself, but, you know, request that you try one of these natural treatments first, but at least you are, you, you are overseen by a professional. Okay, thank you. Um, there's also one, there's a question and Mariam asked it, he said, is there any uh, resources that uh, other than doctors that can help the awareness of depression like uh, books, any doctor that can be uh, referred to? Oh, definitely. Like I said, many, many resources. There are books, there are, you know, you just Google it. There's a lot on the internet. There are professional organizations. Um, you know, uh, a lot of resources where you can learn about it and better understand it. Great, thank you. And then there's a, I think maybe this could be one more uh, question. Um, uh, Nate, he said, how do you recommend, uh, how do you recommend supporting someone who has been diagnosed with depression, acknowledges uh, they are depressed and very stressed with uh, challenges of life, but yet for many years uh, refused to seek treatment or help, uh, what can uh, family or friends do uh, to support them? Well, again, you absolutely, you, you want to support them. But what does that actually mean? Um, it does not mean that we do nothing and we just sit and watch. That's not supportive. Um, supportive would be, uh, you know, to appreciate, to appreciate, to um, have empathy and compassion uh, for the person, for the ill person, the depressed individual. And, you know, you know, continue to encourage them to get treated. Um, I mean, that is the right thing to do for the supportive family and friends. It's also the right thing to do for the depressed person. You know, the depressed person plays a role also. If the depressed person does not want to help themselves, that's a problem. That's a problem. That's no good. So, you know, to encourage understanding, compassion, uh, support, um, uh, reassure them, give them hope, uh, but always, always uh, 
encourage them to get treated. Great. I think Nate also has maybe a follow-up question. He's raising his hand. Is that a follow-up question, Nate? Go ahead. Yes, it is. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Go ahead, Nate. So first of all, Dr. Ibrahim, thank you so much. As always, uh, we appreciate your time and uh, incredible knowledge. Just to follow up to my question, um, so this this individual that I'm, I'm asking about is, this isn't a topic they're willing to discuss, right? So I think when, when you bring up the topic, they completely shut down and further push away family and friends. And this has been going on for many years. And I think I think part of the my question around what can family and friends do is because this is a single parent who's got younger, sort of teenage kids who've also are seeing sort of the ups and downs and negative impact for a few years and actually many years. And so the intent is to support them, but this is a topic that they will absolutely not discuss and admittedly know they have it, uh, have been diagnosed medically, but refuses to do anything about it. And, and you know, uh, you can see this person really at their limit and yet they still sort of push away family and friends. So I, I think you may have answered my question, but it's a bit more delicate and hard to engage on this topic because the person's not willing to allow that conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, it can get, it can get very complicated and difficult and, and so on and so forth. Um, I, I understand and I've, you know, I've seen plenty of that. Um, one of the, a couple of ideas though, you know, sometimes a group of people can be more effective than just one individual. So many times I, I will say to uh, families of the patient, I will say, well, you know, all three of you together approach the patient. First of all, when a group of you approaches a patient rather than one individual. I mean, it's a different message. The message is, oh, this is real. This is serious. Uh, you know, they, they, all, they all agree. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's a stronger message. So that's one idea. Another idea. It's, I mean, even if someone is terribly depressed and, and even if I, I keep saying, be compassionate, be supportive, be loving and all these good things, but ultimately you never want to enable, you know, if, if the if the depressed person is not doing their part, if the depressed person is not cooperating, if the depressed person is opposing, uh, oppositional, okay, the loving, supporting, the loving, supportive family has to use what we call tough love. There is definitely such a thing as tough love, as opposed to going along with the patient, going along with the patient, giving in to the patient, Oh, okay, you're depressed. Well, then, okay, stay in bed all day for weeks. No, no. That's called enabling. So it's very important to, to see the difference between being supportive and sometimes having to use tough love 
versus just going along because you're really enabling that that person to keep keep making mistakes refusing treatment no i don't want to talk about it you know they they they're not functioning uh they are losing days and months and years and and so on and so forth do, do you follow what i'm saying yes thank you so much i appreciate uh, the feedback yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Lucy. Thank you, Nate, for your question, everybody. Uh, there was one, just like, if you don't mind, just one person was raising her, his or her hand for a while uh, using the iPhone. Yes. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yes, doctor, that's me, Mars. I just want to thank uh, doctor first for all this information. And I have one more question. Uh, like, obviously, she just kind of answered the question, but I'm just trying to understand Forgetting things on early age is a uh, symptom of dementia and dep depression. So, you know, like in an early age for young people, how do you convince or how do you help them naturally uh, treat it and then try leading you to, for them to see a doctor, like seek a medication, but natural way first, that way you can convince them, like, you know, you were trying naturally but then this is the way to see a doctor and then cure whatever problem is on early before it gets worse. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. I did hear part of it. Um, but so how do you convince them? Yes. To get help. To get help. But first, like, help them first help them to cure like so forgetting things and early like in your 30s 40s you tend to forget everything but this is not normal but you know it's not normal but you're trying to tell people like to show people it's not normal but it's curable and find natural way to help them understand it's like kind of sickness so it starts my way. For example, if I'm helping my my sister or my friend, it starts my way in a natural way. But then, if the natural way doesn't work, that will help me to go seek a uh, doctor help. Well, I mean, I can see you know that you're you're being very logical, but remember, um, using these natural treatments can also be risky. You know, it's not just because they are natural treatments doesn't mean that they are completely safe. I have seen problems caused by these, you know, St. John's wort and these other, other uh, treatments. So, um, it, you know, I think it's important to be to have the supervision of a professional. Uh, but again, primary care doctors, you can, you can go to your primary care. Uh, you can, you know, go to a psychologist, a therapist, a counselor. Um, you can even see a psychiatrist, but request that you you want to try the natural first. That's okay. I've I've had many patients who ask me who ask me if they could try the natural first. Sometimes it's okay. Sometimes I tell them, you know, they they their symptoms are uh, too severe, and that we need medication. Uh, so. But, but um, you know, I think some kind of professional supervision is important. I guess, can I, can I ask just a general overarching uh, question uh, based on the last few questions that I've heard? Yes. What advice do you have for those individuals that have to deal with family members or friends or spouses and that are not seeking help? And, you know, you, you, you emphasize that you got to be... Uh, 
supportive and 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 you know we talked about the, that individual but what about the other individuals that have to deal with this kind of stuff and what advice would you have with you know like possibly seeking therapy or i don't know uh okay I, i'm sorry um i'm not sure i i understood so are you asking so the, the the question is more so for those individuals that have to deal with someone that's going through uh depression or something some sort of mental illness and that have to deal with with that individual or you know friends and family what advice do you have for those individuals that are not depressed but has to deal with someone that is won't seek help or yes you know it's it's you know it affects the depression in one individual definitely has an impact on everyone you know the surrounding people that the in, you know the home um and it's very frustrating and so on and, and and so forth but as i said um if if we understand that this is an illness and the person cannot help the symptoms then you know we need to be compassionate um and supportive compassionate but I, but again when you know ultimately when push comes to shove compassionate and supportive does not mean that we just sit and watch watch them you know watch them uh ruin their life compassion and supportive does not mean you just we sit we sit and we watch them and do nothing compassion and supportive does not mean that we go along with whatever they want like if they are refusing treatment no we don't go along with that that's where tough love comes in i understand what this is i know you're suffering i'm here to support you in every way you have all my love support i understand i feel for you but you have to do your part you have to do your part you the depressed individual have to do your part you have a responsibility to do your part you have a responsibility to get treated and get well not only is it available but you know whether it's a depressed individual or an individual with cancer or we don't live you know we don't live in a vacuum we don't live in a bubble or a vacuum our life interconnects with others our life affects others family friends neighbors society etc so yes the depressed individual has a role to play and has a responsibility to to get treatment got to do his part or her part so you know this is an example of the tough love that we sometimes have to use
Yeah, thank you so much. It's almost, uh, you know, it's now 6 uh, 20. I think we have to uh, end our here uh, because you spoke almost for, uh, you know, 80 minutes. It's too much for you. No, that's okay. If I see, is there one more question? Yeah, there are some questions, but uh, is that okay? I mean, it's, uh, we don't want, you know, uh, we are keeping it for almost 90 minutes, so it's too much. No, no that's okay. You know, we can go to 6 30, Desali. It's okay. Okay. We are grateful if you can. Okay, test test five. Can you go, go ahead, test five? Yeah. Uh, thank you for giving me a chance. Uh, just I want to ask you about the top lap. Uh, I have a family member. Uh, she been She said that she's been stressed and depressed. We try to give her a lot of help, and the, she's taking a lot of SSRI and the second generation psychotic. But when we try her to do something, uh, sometimes she threatens us. Like she say, "Oh, she will commit suicide." And the whiskers are taking care out from the house and the, like to use the tough love. So how can I address those kind of individuals? Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, we, I know you're asking about tough love, uh, but specifically um, when, when she does what? Uh, she treated us like, you know, we, we discussed with our family member what we can do about her, but she treating us like, oh, I will commit suicide or like, you know, in Habesha family and we cannot, like when somebody treating you, this is a serious and we can, we, we cannot use a tough lap on her. We cannot kick her out from the house or we cannot do anything, but she's just sitting at home, not doing anything, just complaining, complaining. Even we try to take her to a psychiatrist, but sometimes she refuses. She's not adherent to her medication as, as well. So when you say tough love, is there any uh, strategy to, or how we can address like some kind of difficult individuals with tough love? Yes, yes, thank you. I, I, I got it now. Um, you know, first of all, the doctor, the doctor that you go see should know about this and can help you. I mean, my patients come to me and tell me, you know, so-and-so, I mean, the family of my patient will come to me and tell me, uh, the patient doesn't take the medication, the patient uh, won't get out of bed, the patient, you know, and so on and so on. Um, so the doctor, himself can help you with some guidance. The doctor himself can have some words with the patient. Let me give you an example of tough love. Uh, one of my patients has depression. His wife called me uh, several times, a few times in a row. She called me and she got him, she had the phone on speaker. She called me and she said, uh, well, and, and also I saw him here in Chicago, but they, they live in Florida for a number of months. She called me and she told me that her husband is not taking the medication. He is not getting out of bed. Uh, he has very poor hygiene. Uh, he speaks very badly to her, uh, refuses everything. So I told him, I said, this has been going on too long. You are not doing your part. You are not cooperating with treatment. You are not taking responsibility. You're not doing your part. So, you need to make a decision right now, today. You either, if you want to stay under my care, then you follow the treatment plan, you do your part. If you don't, 
then I can no longer treat you because it's, it becomes a, a big risk for me to treat someone who's not cooperating. Secondly, if you keep deteriorating, you'll end up in a hospital, in a psychiatric hospital. And there are a few criteria that we can use to hospitalize someone in psychiatry without their consent. But there are, there are other, um, you know, and, and it's not necessarily threats that you have to use, but there are other, you know, other techniques. You know, you can say, no more complaining. Don't say one word, don't say one complaint, because you don't want to cooperate with treatment. Um, you know, you set limits, you set limits, um, you explain to them that if they choose not to cooperate, okay, but there are consequences. And that's not just for them. It's for every one of us, every one of us. Life is full of choices. You make a choice, you eat the consequences. So this is an example of tough love. But you can also get, you, the doctor can help you with this. A therapist can help you with this. I hope that's helpful. Thank you so much. Just one one question. Okay. I think we have to. Oh, sorry. I, I just did you? Uh, did, I hope she answered the question. No, no, I don't have. I would say, yeah, she did. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you. So, Mayra Fash has questions. So I'm going to give her a chance, and then I think we have to end it. There is almost uh, six thirty. Go, Mayra. Go ahead, Mayra. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Lucy, for your time and effort. Uh, my question is: um, It's a teenager, and understand the admit that suffer from depression, but resist medication. And the reasoning behind it is the medication is going to change my brain chemistry. I don't want to change the way I think. That's the reason behind the refusal of medication. And I was wondering if you have some tips how to convince an individual who already is seeking help, uh, seeing a counselor and uh, diagnosed uh, by psychiatrist, but resist a medication and you can still see the symptom of depression. I would say functional depression because this individual attends college, she's doing good in school, uh, but you can see the challenge and struggle with the social uh, aspect of it and some other uh, symptoms of depression. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, you know, and by the way, there are even, I've had, I've had people say to me, I don't want treatment because when I'm very depressed, I'm, I'm more, you know, more emotionally creative. Uh, or when I'm manic, you know, I, I accomplish a lot of things. Okay. Facts, facts, and facts. Scientific facts. And they are readily available now. Whether you want to talk to your therapist, talk to a psychiatrist, get a book, read online, contact a professional organization, but scientific fact. Okay? These medications absolutely do not change brain chemistry um, 
they correct. They do not change. They do not alter. They are not mood altering drugs like the drugs that make you high. Uh, they do not change your brain chemistry. They do not do anything that is permanent. All they do is correct a problem. They correct or reestablish a balance so the person's nervous system is back to normal, normal, whatever that is for that individual. Okay? That's the truth. That's the scientific basis. So when people, you know, when people say otherwise, you know, it, what, what are they using an excuse? Are they using an excuse not to take medication? That's what it is. They're using an excuse not to take medication. Why? Why? You don't want to get well? Or is there some other reason why you don't want to take medication, but you are using excuses because you are saying something that is absolutely false. I hope that helps, helps, you know, with your problem. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's right now it's a uh, 6, uh, 33. Um, I think uh, we have to stop it here. So on the behalf of the Eritrean Assist Assistance Organization in York in Chicago, I would like to thank you uh, for speaking to us. We are grateful for the time and effort you took to share your thought, your experience and the experts with us today. We are grateful. Thank you again for, for this truly memorable uh, evening. Uh, we hope you can join us another time. But uh, we bombarded you with a lot of questions yeah, and okay. it's too much for you. I understand. No, 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 that's. Uh, but you are too kind person, you know, so uh, may God help you. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, that's that's why we do this. And you are most welcome. And I thank you for having faith in me that you ask, ask me to speak. But um, you're most welcome anytime. Yeah, thank you so much. So